What's up, folks? What's going on? Welcome to episode 122 of the Spun Today podcast. I'm your host, Tony Ortiz. Thank you very much for listening. In this episode, I share my January and February 2019 writing stats, a couple of writing tips that I picked up along the way. I tell you about what I've been reading. And finally, I read and reflect on some of my free writing, which is located at spuntoday.com forward slash free writing. If any of that sounds of interest to you, stick around. And if not, stick around anyway. But before we jump in, a quick word on how you can help sponsor the Spun Today podcast. If you're new to the podcast and would like to help support, check out my book, Make Way For You, Tips For Getting Out Of Your Own Way. It's available in any and every ebook platform of your choosing, as well as in paperback via Amazon.com. For more information about the book, check out spuntoday.com forward slash books. There, you also have the opportunity to drop in your email address and get a free copy delivered to you in a digital format of your choosing. Again, go to spuntoday.com forward slash books. Another way to help support the podcast is by becoming a patron. For more on that, go to patreon.com forward slash spuntoday. That's patreon spelled P A T. R-E-O-N dot com forward slash spun today. There you're able to make a financial contribution to the podcast on a reoccurring basis in an amount of your choosing, whether it be a dollar, two dollars, a couple G's or whatever your heart desires. Again, for that option, go to patreon.com forward slash spun today. All right, my writing stats. I like providing my writing stats as a way to keep myself honest and to gauge my progress of this journey of wanting to be a credible writer. And what my writing sets are, are simply a count of how many days out of a particular month I wrote and how many versus how many days I didn't write. And I give you guys the percentage of that. And by writing, it could be anything from a free writing piece, like the one I'm going to share with you guys today at the end of the episode, or towards the end of the episode, rather, a short story, like the ones that can be found at spuntoday.com forward slash short stories, or writing and or editing of my debut novel, which is coming out, as promised, in Q1 2019 unless something unforeseen happens. And the specific date that I'm targeting is March 28th, which happens to be my father's birthday. So I have about a week to finish ironing out a few details and tying up some loose ends to be able to crank that puppy out as expected. And as you guys know, I've been working on the novel for a good minute. So a lot of my uh, writing stats for definitely for the past few months has been strictly focused on novel related work. So that said, my writing stats for January 2019 are that I wrote 21 out of the 31 days. So that's a percentage of 67.7% writing percentage for the month of January 2019. For February 2019, I wrote 20 out of the 28 days for a writing percentage of 71.4%. The percentage is a bit higher than January's, which is good, but it's slightly misleading because uh, February does have two to three or three less days than January does. Just saying, keeping myself honest. Now, during these free writing session episodes, I share a writing tip that I've picked up either by listening to writing podcasts or reading or watching an interview with a a writer or publisher or someone related to the writing community or from reading blog posts by writers. But in this episode, you're getting two writing tips that I wanted to share. So bonus for you. As always, I will link to 
any and all sources that I'm referencing, such as this one today, in the episode notes of the podcast. So this first writing tip is from K.M. Wyland, and it's titled The 10-Step Checklist to Writing an Above Average Novel. And she goes on to say, read top 10. Sorry, she does not go on to say read top 10. I'm saying I'm going to read the top 10. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read each of the top 10s and probably give you a few sentences or excerpts from the entire blog post, which I recommend you guys go read yourselves so you can get the full context of everything and get as much valuable information out of it as possible. Number one is habit plot. And she goes on to say that this should be obvious, but uh, it's not so, especially in the beginning for new writers. And she goes on to ask and then answer her own question, stating, so what is plot? That question, of course, is one we walk, we, sorry, we talk about a lot on this blog. And she links to a specific article titled, How to Choose Your Stories Plot Points. But today I'm going to sum it up like this. Plot is a well-structured story with a cohesive point. And then she has some more information on that there. Step number two to writing an above average novel is give your characters strong desires and goals. Kim Weiland says the fastest route to a solid plot is via your character's desires. What do these people want? I don't mean some general principle like love or peace, and I don't even mean just a plot goal like kill those aliens. I'm talking about making sure every scene features a solid, driving, urgent desire and resultant goal. Step number three, make sure your characters spend more time doing stuff than talking about A, what they've already done, and B, what they're going to do. That's like the very popular show-don't-tell philosophy behind writing. You know, like, instead of one character speaking to another character and them, uh, uh, you know, telling them, hey, today I went to the store, and uh, when I went to the store, I bought a sandwich, and on my way home, I found a quarter on the floor, and I picked it up, and then I came here, and blah, 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 blah. Instead of writing a scene that way, write a scene... Or get across those same points, rather, by writing a scene about the person going to the store and purchasing the sandwich and, you know, walking home and finding the cord on the floor, etc. Like, write out that scene. Instead of writing a scene about that character describing that scene. Show, don't tell. Step four is ruthlessly chop dramatic subplots that only exist to create exciting climaxes. Step four is ruthlessly, without the blah, 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 ruthlessly chop dramatic subplots that only exist to create exciting climaxes. And she goes on to say, an oft-referenced screenwriting principle is that of creating an emotional B story to augment the plot's main A story. Although this approach offers some immediately practicable benefits. I dislike its suggestion that there can be, quote, two stories. Bottom line, every piece of your story must contribute to the big picture of the plot and theme. If any subplot doesn't do that, then it doesn't belong. And me personally, I kind of agree and disagree with that tip. At least for me, from my perspective, because... I like the A story and the B story and sometimes even the C storyline approach to writing. And although I do believe that they can't just be random, completely different things that have nothing to do with anything. Or not that they can't be. They shouldn't be for my personal taste. I do recognize that there are different threads going on in stories that I like. Like my novel, for instance, has a focus on time travel and the plot is of a group of people in this subculture that has the ability to time travel, 
going back in time and righting wrongs and righteously correcting for injustices. But there are two characters in the story that take a liking to each other. Think uh, Neo and Trinity in The Matrix, for example. And that's a different piece of the story that can be thought of as the B story or like the love story subgenre to the sci-fi time travel A story. But in and of itself, their relationship and their liking each other doesn't have anything to do with the time travel. Except for that it's like a common thing that they can bond over and pretty much it's how they met. Anyway, that's my take on number four. Number five, make your characters earn their romances. And that point is pretty much to not just stick to people together type of thing. You know, make it a little more realistic how it is in real life. Like, two people don't just see each other and start making out on the train and fall in love and live happily ever after. Number six, give every character someone to talk to. She goes on to say, what's the most interesting part of a story? Everybody's mileage is going to vary a little on this one, but I'll bet most of us would agree our favorite parts are where characters get together and talk to each other. And I couldn't agree more. As you guys know, I love dialogue. My debut novel, titled Fractal, by the way, for anybody who's interested, is heavy, heavy, heavy on dialogue. I love dialogue. That's why Aaron Sorkin is my favorite screenwriter, big screen and small screen. Uh, I love Quentin Tarantino movies uh, for that reason, for the heavy dialogue. And for me personally, it's the, the funnest, most most natural occurring thing to me when I write. Like it flows easily for me when I'm writing dialogue. And don't get it twisted. That's not to say that my dialogue is anywhere near the level of those folks or that it's any good. I'm just saying that it flows out of me. It could be complete dog shit. And I'll let <laughs> you guys and the ultimate reviews of Fractal be the judge of that. But... Or you guys can check out some of my short stories at sponsor.com forward slash short stories, which will give you a good idea into my uh, style of dialogue writing, of heavy dialogue writing rather. But yeah, it's just something that, that I've mentioned before as when I'm writing a scene with two or more characters interacting, the characters start speaking and it's almost as if they're speaking through me. Like they already know what they're going to say to each other and the story winds up stories wind up taking or having completely different outcomes oftentimes from where i intended them to go in the beginning because the characters get in the way not in a bad way but they get in the way and steer the ship in different directions so i almost feel it's more of a like a vessel to like the shit that they have to say if that makes any sense all right, step number seven to writing an above-average novel, as referenced by K.M. Wyland, is include only purposeful POVs. POVs, for those of you that don't know, is points of view, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. But again, definitely check out the post so that you can read more into that. Step number eight, make sure all characters have agency. Step number nine is play by your own rules. And she goes on to say, this one is important for all authors, but particularly for those writing multi-book stories, whether you're creating complex magic systems or simply sharing a character's backstory or even just applying foreshadowing hints in the first part of a story. You must be consistent. Readers trust you. They believe that what you tell them is so if that turns out to not be the case even if it's just the result of negligence on your part the results can vary from a simple intellectual wrinkling of the nose to an emotional chucking of your book either way it's not in anybody's interest you made these rules for your story it's only fair you remember to follow them and that makes sense right I mean, you're writing a story, 
and you know people could fly or something like that in chapter one in chapter eight you don't want to say oh yeah because nobody's ever been able to fly you know what i mean set up the structure of your story whatever the rules are within that story and stick to them i definitely completely agree with that and step number 10 for writing an above average novel by Cam wyland is have style you can get an A plus on, she goes on to say, you can get an A plus on all of the previous nine principles of above average writing, but it probably won't matter if readers end up labeling your book as bland. Truly memorable stories are usually less memorable for what they share than they are for how they share it. And that's definitely true. And that is probably like the most standout feature of the book that I've been reading that I'm going to tell you guys about in a bit, which is The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow by Juno Diaz. But just to wrap things up here, um, this article, again, is titled The 10-Step Checklist to Writing an Above Average Novel by K.M. Wyland. And I will link to it in the episode notes of this episode. For those of you listening to this episode, like on your phones, for example, on a, on a podcatcher, the episode notes, and you don't know, if you don't know, the episode notes are, like, if you look at your phone, uh, click on, like, the details button uh, on the podcast, and all the episode notes will be there. And if you're listening on a computer, or if you just want to access the episode notes later on a computer just go to my website at sponsorate.com forward slash free writing i'm sorry sponsorate.com forward slash podcast and there you'll find each and every episode of the sponsorate podcast and all the episode notes and links and uh you can go straight directly to this specific episode or any episode by putting the number of the episode at the end of that URL. So it'll be sponsorate.com forward slash podcast forward slash 122 for this specific episode. Or just go to sponsorate.com forward slash podcast and find the one that you're looking for. All right. The second tip, the bonus tip that I'm going to be sharing with you guys today is from Stephen Pressfield, the person that wrote The War of Art, which is responsible for me deciding to take this writing shit seriously. And he wrote a very interesting post called The Villain Doesn't Change. And this one's uh, this post is pretty short enough that I'm just going to read the whole thing to you guys. But definitely uh, check it out. Or if you want to subscribe to Stephen Pressfield's uh, Writing Wednesdays, which is uh, how I received this post, uh, please do so. Go on his website, which again, I'll link to in the episode notes. And you can subscribe to Writing Wednesdays and he sends tips like this. Uh, every Wednesday. And for those of you that don't know who Stephen Pressfield is, he's written several books, including my favorite, which is The War of Art. He wrote uh, several novels, such as The Legend of Bagger Vance, which was an option that made into a movie starring Will Smith and Matt Damon. Matt Damon. And he also wrote the novel Gates of Fire or Gates of Hell. One of those two. Uh, which was then adopted and made into the mo- the uh, movie 300, etc., etc., etc. And in this post, he's writing about the villain and the fact that he never changes, and he makes his case for it. So he writes, The craziest working arrangement I ever had in the screenwriting biz was working... was when I worked for a producer I'll call Joan Stark. Joan insisted that I write in her office. I had to come in every day. Joan gave me a little cubbyhole beside the photocopy machine. I'd work on pages all morning and half the afternoon. Then we'd meet and Joan would go over the day's work and give me corrections. Every day she had problems with the same character, the villain. She kept making me rewrite his scenes. One day I asked, what mistake was I making? And she responded, 
you're having the villain change. The villain can't change. I didn't get it. Why not? And she responded, because if the villain changed, he'd be the hero. I remember thinking that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Don't we want the bad guy to be interesting? Shouldn't he evolve like the hero? Answer, no. The alien doesn't change. The shark in Jaws doesn't change. The Terminator in The Terminator doesn't change. And when he does, in the sequels, oh my god, he becomes the hero. Or co-hero. And we have new Terminators who don't change, who now become the villains. I realized I had to start thinking more deeply about this. Indeed, external villains don't change. Every antagonist in a James Bond movie, every supervillain lining up against Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, Iron Man, the Fantastic Four, the X-Men, every force of nature villain, volcanoes, tsunamis, Mayan predicted worldwide destruction, asteroids crashing into the earth, tripods invading New Jersey, global climate catastrophes, none of these is capable of change. Zombies don't change. Vampires don't change. The thing doesn't change. All these bad guys have one single-minded desire. To eat your brain. To suck your blood. To destroy or dominate the world. To give birth to baby bad guys. Societal villains, as opposed to external villains, don't change. Racism in To Kill a Mockingbird. The Help. Black Klansmen, Homophobia in Philadelphia, Dallas Buyers Club, Moonlight. The societal villain in Thelma and Louise, ran by Callie Khoury, who won the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay, is male contempt for and domination of women. The film depicts me as loudish husbands, Sorry, let me take that sentence back. The film depicts men as loudish husbands, leering truck drivers, sneak-thieving hitchhikers, trigger-happy cops, and FBI agents. And the arch-villain, Harlan Puckett, who commits the initial sexual assault on Thelma as a brutish, contemptuous, would-be rapist. None of these bad guys changes. What's interesting about Keely Corey's character construction is that she does give us one decent man. Arkansas State Police Investigator Hal Slocomb. Hal is the only one among the cohort of law enforcement Lumoxes pursuing Thelma and Louise who actually has sympathy for the women's predicament and wants to help them. Hal even strikes up a bit of a telephonic friendship with Louise as she, as he seeks to keep the police chase from getting out of control and devolving into a bloodbath. Does this make Hal a villain who changes and thus an exception to my producer boss, Joan Stark's rule? In the movie's climax, when Thelma and Louise flee from the cops toward Grand Canyon thin air, in their 66 Thunderbird convertible, it's Hal who rushes forward on foot into the path of all-out police gunfire to try to stop and save the ladies. Does Hal's act make him a villain who changes? Yes. But our employer, Joan Stark, comes out right in the end. If the villain changed, he'd be the hero. Hal becomes, by his actions, not a villain, but the protagonist of the C or D story, the police chase subplot. He becomes a hero. The villain never changes. And that's it. I thought that was a pretty dope piece and some great advice that I'm definitely heeding from a seasoned writer. And it's just interesting to think about, in my opinion, the like level of detail and structure and intention and formula behind writing. 
because writing is absolutely all types of creative but it's also all this type of technical and formula as well like meshed together and i love that kind of stuff uh, again the title of this article is the villain doesn't change by stephen pressfield and it's linked to in the episode notes all right so back to the km wyland uh, point number 10 of style which is a good segue to the book that i'm currently reading or that i just finished reading for the second time which is the brief wondrous life of oscar wow written by juno diaz which is a dominican writer a fellow dominican american writer whose writing i find so dope and it's because of his style the first person to put me on to juno diaz was a many years ago but i didn't like pay attention to her at that point in time uh a friend of mine elaine who's been on the podcast in the past and has submitted actually a She's a fellow writer and has submitted a sponsored questionnaire, which any fellow writer or fellow creative can fill out for free. And I'll share with the other folks here on the podcast that can be found at sponsored.com forward slash questionnaire. If you're interested, it's just like five open ended questions on your craft and what you do and what you like and tips and shit like that. Um, but she first told me about this Dominican writer who's dope. And uh, she told me about his short story collection his anthology uh drown titled drown and i didn't listen didn't pay attention i was like okay yeah cool whatever cool story bro (laughs) and then i would say years later when when i actually wanted to like start uh, reading more uh my brother put me on my brother david put me on to i want to say it was the brief wondrous life of oscar wilde but i'm not positive that it was that book i think it may have been this is how you lose her which is another book by juno diaz but the point is i've read each of those books and i can't remember now if oscar wilde was the first one which i think it was maybe it was that one and then I read Drown, which was uh, this collection of short stories. And then uh, This Is How You Lose Her. Going back to my main point, which is just uh, Juno Diaz's style of writing. He has his own distinct style. And it's one of those books that I read that kind of opened up my eyes from, uh, especially now in retrospect, from a writing perspective, to say, oh, that's that's writing too. Like you could write like that if you can make it good. You know what I mean? Like he, he writes Spanglish, you know, he throws some Spanish words in there unapologetically and doesn't like define what each Spanish word means. Like he knows who his audience is, which not to say that just Spanish people read his stuff. Cause actually one of my coworkers wives, I spoke to once and we were, we all like randomly met up at a comedy show once. And I forgot how Juno Diaz came up, but he did. And it was like her favorite writer. And she's a white girl. You know what I mean? That doesn't speak Spanish at all. So obviously it's, it works. The storytelling is great, incredible. But me as a Dominican and a wannabe writer myself, when I see things like that, it's like encouraging. When I see a style like that, it's encouraging. It's, also actually the reason why i decided to with my debut novel write the dialogue in the format that i did a lot of stories have or a lot of books rather that aren't as heavy in dialogue have quotes around everything that's said and it's like hi how you doing end quote said timothy quote i'm doing fine thanks how are you quote said miguel you know it has like all those you know who said what and quotation marks around every single thing that's that's every every single piece of dialogue 
and uh, Juno Diaz does, doesn't write his dialogue in that way. Um, his way of writing uh, dialogue, I would say, is more similar in like visual visually how you would see in a screenplay, where it's kind of like in quote text f- uh, block format, where it's like a like a double in- indent kind of on the page. And you just write out what one person says, and then, you know, you skip a line, double in that again, then write what the other person says back, skip a line, double in that again, and so forth. And if your dialogue is on point enough, at least from my perspective, then you can read that dialogue and you get the flow and you know who's saying what without having to explain said Jane, said Miguel, said so-and-so, and putting quotes around everything. And I think that's a skill in and of itself. I think it's dope. I began writing my own short stories in that format, in that way, um, unconsciously, I think. Uh, But I I, meaning I unconsciously uh, picked it up prior from reading Lake Chino Diaz's work. And but I definitely made the the conscious decision based off of uh, rereading Juno Diaz. Because it was definitely part of the math while I was formatting my my debut novel, Fractal. Pick it up a week from now. <laughs> and I was like, fuck. I didn't write it with quotation marks around every every single thing. I, I, I wrote it in the style that I'm used to writing. The style that I've written my short stories in. And But then I'm checking out different different novels, different books. And I'm like, damn, most, you know, most, almost all of these aren't written that way. And I even reached out to a couple of writers ask, asking like their opinions on this. And it was like, everything is telling me to write with the quotation marks and stuff like that, which is like the most common form, I guess, of the, the way you would see dialogue in, in a novel. But again, it depends on genre, of course, but even across different genres that, that I looked at, it was all like that. But I know that they're not as dialogue heavy. Like I'm very dialogue heavy. Like you have pages and pages of just straight dialogue within my book. So it's not practical either for me to go that the the other route. And I just felt like uncomfortable doing it because it's not the way I write. And part of me was like, "Fuck it, you know, you gotta fucking break the rules and do your own thing," type of thing. But then. The other part of me is like, eh, slow, slow your roll. You know what I mean? You don't know what the fuck you're doing. But I was so reluctant to write it in that way. And then I revisited Juno Diaz's works. And he didn't write it in that way. He wrote it in the way that I wrote it. And I'm like, oh shit, that's probably where I fucking picked it up in the first place. And that in and of itself gave me the confidence to be like, you know what, fuck that. I'm going to write it how I feel comfortable writing it. This is how I write, you know? That's my style, I guess. And clearly, obviously, I'm not the only person with that style. But, yeah, I'm glad I made that decision. But, yeah, and the story is so... It's so fucking good. It, it's very, very character-driven. It, he tells, like, the backstory of several characters. Pretty much... Yes, yeah, several, several characters... All the main characters, definitely, but, you know, some of the supporting cast he doesn't, like, go too into detail about, but, you know, there's, like, chapters dedicated to the main characters. And then the person narrating it, narrating the story, or telling the story, is, uh, winds up being a character later on in the book. So even his backstory gets revealed when you piece that together. Like, who he is and stuff like that. And there's a lot of uh, historical reference to, you know, things and politics and places and shit in the Dominican Republic. Because it goes back and forth from DR to Jersey. And there's flashback scenes and the mother grew up in DR and the grandmother. So that was cool. Just to hear, like, general things about uh, how bad of a dictator... At least from the writer's perspective, uh, Trujillo was. And then uh, to a lesser extent, Balaguer afterwards. 
and how Balaguer was like a, a crony of Trujillo. And it's just, it's a really dope read. You guys should definitely check it out. I got a link to it in the episode notes, actually. I have the hard copy book, and which is uh, how I read it the first time around. But this time around, I got the, the audio book. And I, th- I, I picked up on something that I'm not positive yet. But I will find out soon because I, I lucked out with the audiobook that I purchased his anthology his short story collection uh, was also in the back end of the audiobook for the brief wonders life of Oscar Wow so it's like you get two books in one and I wasn't expecting that at all it was like a bonus type of thing but what I think I picked up on is that I think a lot of the short stories in drown are characters but like backs you know they're kind of like little backstories in and of themselves or side stories or just like additional stories of those same characters or some of the same characters that are used in a uh, brief wonders life of oscar wow like there's in drown there's a story about a, a little kid called israel in the campo that uh his face got eaten uh, when he was a baby by a pig and he had like a mask on and then in a brief wonder's life of oscar wow there's a story of like an older gentleman that he's like part of through his crew and he has no face and he's like one of his like henchmen that does his dirty work and shit like that and i wonder if that's like the same character just like grown up you know and there's another story about uh a guy named Junior, which is the character that I mentioned was like the narrator in Oscar Wilde. And he had this side job of uh, delivering pool tables and stuff like that in Jersey. And there's a story of a guy named Junior in a short story of a guy named Junior in Drown that delivers pool tables and shit like that. So I, I'm going to re-listen to Drown, the stories in Drown, and now that Oscar Wilde is, like, fresh in my head, and see if, like, I can make, like, more of those connections. Which, if that's the case, that's, like, some dope, intricate, Harry Potter-level type world setup and creation that Juno Diaz did, and that would be just, like, some genius shit. But, yeah, anyway, that's what I've been reading. Now... I'm going to round off the episode with some of my free writing. And I'm just going to read one post for you guys today. And you guys can find it at spuntoday.com forward slash free writing. And I posted it on the website on March 20th, 2019. As you guys know, free writing, I do it by hand. So I have uh, notebooks that I do my free writing in. And, you know, I go through them from, from time to time. If I see anything that's good or share or that I'd like deem quote unquote shareable, with you guys, I'll post it here on the site. So I posted it on the site on January 20th, 2019, but I actually wrote it on April, in April of 2016. All right. And the post is titled, How to Create a Goal Setting and Achieving Strategy. And I wrote, You should have a goal setting and achieving strategy. A fundamental system in place by which you can measure your accomplishments or lack thereof. A way to gauge yourself against your desires. Here are two different approaches, both of which I use interchangeably, as I take aim toward a goal. Number one, set attainable goals. Purposely attainable. In an under-promise, over-deliver way. This way, you inch yourself toward said goal. Each smaller achievable goal serving as a stepping stone. A small burst of motivation coming from each momentum building achieved goal. Number two, set massive monumental goals. You want the sun, the moon, and the stars? Go for it. This will balance your big picture pursuits with your incremental changes. Then I go on to write, either approach can prove to be effective if you implement a couple of mental safeguard mechanisms. When you're using approach number one, you can't get discouraged. That's it. Just that one thing. Do not get discouraged. 
don't view the incremental gains as a means to an end. If you apply this method, it's because the mini victories along the way will boost you. They'll keep you engaged and motivated. Don't allow yourself to get discouraged by, quote, how many more, end quote, gains you need to achieve the big picture goal. Adjust your perception. Because that, that's not the purpose of the first approach, right? The first approach is just little achievable goals. So as long as you're doing that, you're good. Then adjust your perception as needed. When you're using approach number two, you can't be against adjusting downward. Amending your benchmarks according to your progress. This allows for the fluidity needed when the inevitable curveballs that life throws at you come your way. Understand that your goal is static. It's not changing unless you want it to, but the path to it can and will. Be okay with that. Also, find in yourself the ability to realize that you already have the sun, the moon, and all of the stars in the sky. Maybe just not in the way you thought. Look up. Look around. And I wrote that on Monday, April 25th, 2016 at 9.53 a.m. Now, let's break it down a bit. So, set attainable goals. I'll give you guys a practical example of this. I want to start eating healthier. And as a first step towards that, I figured one place where I don't, you know, sit like I'm I'm a like a picky eater in the sense that like I, I like getting with the knife at fork. I don't like getting with my hands too much. Uh, I like, you know, enjoying my meal. I don't like eating quickly. I don't, you know, if I have something to do, I don't eat until I don't have anything to do until I got everything that I have to get done, done. And then, you know, I'd rather put off eating until I can sit down and actually enjoy a meal as slowly as I damn well please. So, and I don't eat breakfast. Like, eight days out of ten, nine days out of ten, I don't eat breakfast. It's usually just black coffee. So, a way for me to start trying to eat healthier was having salads at lunch. So I started off by uh, just buying salads and I went to this place by, by my job called Just Salad and they have a bunch of different types of salads and uh, they were really good. I liked them. And I was like, yo, these are like good enough for me to actually want to, you know, be okay with eating them. So I started making my own and I tried to replicate like the types of salads that, that they made. And it's been working out great. So the difference between setting it up as a, or approaching the I want to eat healthier idea with, you know, I'm just going to cut out carbs completely or cut out sugar completely or, you know, never eat fast food or like all those things is that at least for me, I'll do that, but then I'll yo-yo back into my old habits. Like it'll be a yo-yo diet, you know. I'll, I'll go, go hard for a couple of weeks, and then it's too much to bear, type of thing. And then you know I'll have a cheat day, and then a cheat day will turn into a cheat week, and then a cheat week will turn into what the fuck is a diet? So, I implemented this, which I've stuck with for several months now. I can't even remember how long, where I eat only salads for lunch. And that's it. Like, that's the change that I figured was attainable because I actually like the salads. And it's not, you know, I'm not doing, you know, I eat whatever the fuck I want for dinner. I, you know, any snacks and nothing else changes. Just for lunch, instead of the usual, like, street meat, halal food or pizza or or, uh, sandwiches and chips and, like, shit like that that I was eating, it's a salad. That's it. And I'll take it even a step further. I didn't make it just, like, straight spinach with no dressing and and you know only a hundred calorie salad because i know for me that wouldn't be sustainable so instead it's salads that have not heavy on dressing because i'm not big on dressing anyway so it's just like oil and vinegar but 
uh, I have stuff in there like blueberries and uh, grilled chicken and uh, feta cheese or mozzarella cheese or jack cheese or, you know, and like different things in the salad. So the salad's like calorie range is like like four or five hundred calories. But that to me is doable. And it's not as good, obviously, as eating a hundred calorie salad. But a hundred calorie salad for me in two weeks, I would have been back to eating sandwiches at lunch. And I'm not comparing to the 100 calorie salad. I'm comparing to the 1500 calorie halal food with a whole bunch of sauces and shit on it that I was eating. So that was that's a practical implementation of this idea that I'm putting forth. Now it feels unnatural for me not to have salad at lunch because I do break that rule once a month. Uh, the last day of the month, my job gives like free pizza out and even then i get pizza and a salad but whatever i still eat pizza (laughs) um and yeah so now what i should do what i plan to do what i should have done already is then make an incremental change to my dinner you know and then you know continue you know small small victories maybe for dinner i won't go as hard and i'll just change something like half the carbs for my dinner until I could, you know, make that better to no carbs for dinner and, you know, stuff like that. And then the number two on here is, I think is just as important, but less practical, which is having massive goals, which is dreaming, which is wanting to do something with your life, which, which is, you know, wanting to be a writer and, you know, one day see one of your stories made into a movie on the big screen. Or Netflix, I'll take a Netflix or Amazon deal, you know? You know, having those lofty type of goals without losing sight of the incremental, necessary, attainable goals and tasks that it would take to build up to one day being in the realm of possibility of something like that happening, like keeping track of your writing, how many days a month are you writing, trying to increase that to writing more days every month, writing more days than this month and the month prior. Reading and sharing and seeking out tips and advice like the ones I shared today from different writers. And all in all, not losing sight of the shit that you already do have. Like, don't just get bogged down in these small goals or even in the big goals. Realize and be okay with the the stuff they do have, the wins they do have, the people they do have now in the present. And appreciate all that as well. And one particular line that stands out to me from this post, which is the last thing I'm going to say here. Um, just like in a, I just like the way it sounds, like the way it flows, like the way that, that I wrote it, like the way it came out. Is, uh, it's the second, third sentence. A way to gauge yourself against your desires. I don't know. I just. I like that line. A way to gauge yourself. Against your desires. Check yourself. Before you rickety wreck yourself. That's episode 122 of the Spun Today podcast. Folks. Thank you very much for listening. Again my name is Tony Ortiz. Stick around. Listen to some tunes in the background for a bit. While I queue up for you. Several ways in how you can help support the podcast. If you you want to which you should and stay tuned for a possible bonus episode next week but shh you didn't hear that from me peace
Would you like to receive a short email from me once a week? You know that feeling you have on a Monday at work when you have absolutely nothing to look forward to except for lunch? Have no fear, the Midday Monday Boost Letter is here. In this short weekly newsletter, you will receive five things. One is a photograph of the week from a photographer, a podcast of the week. I listen to tons of podcasts, dozens and dozens of podcasts, hundreds of episodes, and I cherry pick the best ones and I share them with you here. You'll also receive a video of the week, which could be anything from a rap battle to a TED talk. You receive a quote of the week, something to let marinate in your mind, and a word of the week so that you and I can both step up our vocab. So if any of that sounds of interest to you, check it out. Check out the subscribe page at spuntray.com forward slash subscribe. Drop in your email address and you'll receive the very next one. For any writers or creatives out there, I have a questionnaire. It's a five question questionnaire that anyone is free to fill out. It's located at spuntray.com forward slash questionnaire. And what it is, is five open-ended questions related to your craft. It's things like what inspires you to write or create whenever you don't feel the inspiration to do so. What are your favorite apps or tools or tricks to trick yourself into getting into the mind state of actually creating? What inspires you, etc., etc., stuff like that. And what I do with your responses is share them on a future episode of the podcast. Now, you can choose to remain anonymous if you choose to. You have that option right there when you fill out the questionnaire. And if you do not choose to remain anonymous, I give you a shout out on the podcast and promote for free whatever it is that you have going on. So I appreciate you in advance for sharing that with me, as well as the rest of the listeners of the Sponsor Today podcast, which would stand to gain from you filling out the questionnaire. Now, you can help support the podcast in a myriad of ways. One way which does not cost you anything and is most popular within the podcasting community is by shopping on Amazon using my affiliate links banner. So the way that works is you go to sponsored.com forward slash affiliate links or just click on the affiliate links tab at the top center of the page. And there you will see a banner for Amazon. You literally just click on that and it takes you to Amazon's website where you do your shopping like you normally do. It does not cost you anything extra, but Amazon will give me a kickback just for driving traffic to their website. So that would be a big help. It literally costs you nothing extra financially, just costs you a couple of extra clicks of your mouse before you do your Amazon shopping. The iTunes banner that's on that same page works the same way. So if you're purchasing music or movies or whatever it is on iTunes, feel free to go through my affiliate link portal there as well. If you want to make a one-time PayPal donation, feel free to do so. There's a PayPal donation button on there as well. Within that same tab, you'll also find a link to the Spun Today Viral Style Store. Now, the Viral Style Store is a store where you can get Spun Today merch, whether it's a coffee mug or a t-shirt that I personally designed. And spoiler alert, I'm no... I'm no Ralph Lauren or, you know, whoever designs Gucci stuff, (laughs) but I did create the design of those shirts myself. I have a couple t-shirts on there. One that says, for example, right need every day, which is a play off of Snoop, Dre and Nate Dogg's smoke weed every day. So it's right need every day. with like a puff cloud of smoke behind it. I have a podcast versus everybody t-shirt and uh, just stuff like that. So check it out. The link to the viral style store is also there. You can also help support the podcast on a reoccurring basis. If you become a Patreon supporter. Now, Patreon is pretty cool and it there's a little um, video explanation of what it is and how it works, but I'll try to do my best to summarize it here. Basically, you sign on to Patreon, which is a free service for your account, and you can support not just myself, but any other uh, podcasters or creatives that also have Patreon pages. And you can choose to, for example, donate a dollar to them on a per episode basis. So the Spun Today podcast has two uh, episodes a month. So if you donate a dollar to it, it'll be two dollars a month, basically. And you set it up 
and it just happens automatically on a reoccurring basis there are zero fees you can cancel at any time no hassle no bullshit and it's uh it's a cool way to help support and is much appreciated and also it's not just like a for example uh a paypal donation which is just that but through patreon it allows the creator in this case being myself to set up a reward system if you will so if you donate a dollar per episode you are considered a tier one supporter if you donate three dollars per episode you are a second tier supporter etc etc and it goes up to four tiers and each tier gets different things like uh, tier one gets a free spun today bookmark and a shout out on the podcast tier three gets uh gets those two things from tier one as well as a free writing piece that's not posted on on my website or available to anyone else etc etc so check that out if you will and uh, visit my patreon page at patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash spun today another great amazing way to help support the podcast is to rate and review it this costs you absolutely nothing whether you listen on itunes on stitcher on TuneIn on iHeartRadio, on Pocket Casts, on Overcast, on Player FM, on Google Play, on YouTube, on Tumblr, or if you listen on Podbay or any other of your favorite podcast apps. Please rate and review the episode. It really is the number one way to help the show gain traction, gain exposure. You know, you could also share with friends or family and tell them, yo, check out what this idiot is saying. Some of it is actually pretty good. Or it all fucking sucks and you should listen and laugh. But as long as you're listening, (laughs) it would be much appreciated. So rate and review the podcast wherever it is that you listen. Follow me on Twitter or on Instagram at Spun Today. Like the Facebook fan page at facebook.com forward slash Spun Today. Subscribe to my YouTube page as well. All podcast episodes are available on YouTube as well as clipped versions for example with the random rant episodes you know i speak about a bunch of different topics instead of having the full episode alone which is also available on youtube but you also have snippets of the different topics broken up into more digestible chunks so check that out you can also support by checking out my book make way for you tips for getting out of your own way it's a quick short read if you're looking for some inspiration and motivation and you can find out more about it at spuntray.com forward slash books. There you'll find a video of me telling you all how the book came to fruition, as well as a couple of audio excerpts. If you're interested, you can purchase it wherever books are sold. Kindle, iBooks, Kobo, an ebook or paperback format, which you can find on Amazon. Also, for being a Spun Today listener, I can also send you a free copy right there on that same landing page at sponsor.com forward slash books drop in your email address at the bottom of the page and i'll shoot you over a copy in the format of your choice and that's all i got folks thanks again for checking out this episode and as always substitute the mysticism with hard work and start taking steps in the general direction of your dreams thanks for listening